shall send to the moon a giant rocket.
Hi, David Mould here. Welcome to our series of telecasts entitled Finding America in Bible Prophecy. That's the overall title, but we're going to be going in depth into some prophecies here in order to prove to you that when I say this is America, it is America. All right? Back in the day, Chances are you saw Ian Boyne and I getting at it in serious, heated debate at times, but also in playful disagreement on his program, Religious Hard Talk. I was his guest on at least five telecasts over the years. While I'd like to close this clip with something over which we had our disagreements, I first want to talk to you about COVID-19. I've said it for years, you don't have to be a Christian today to feel in your bones that something big is coming. Not just upon Jamaica, but upon the world. How does COVID-19 fit into this scenario? Is it, is it a sign? I believe it is. Now, I'm not going to get into this speculation about this virus being man-made or that it is somehow associated with 5G networks, no matter how slick or persuasive the presentations that make these points may be. Me, personally, I don't believe any of it. All right? I don't believe any of that stuff, but I do believe COVID-19 is a sign. Along with the increasing frequency of earthquakes, tsunamis, famines, and pestilences, etc., I believe COVID-19 is part of a pattern, one more sign of the second coming of Christ, just as he said. Now, I'm not, I'm not setting any dates today. But long before COVID-19, I stated publicly that I personally didn't believe our planet had much more than another decade left. I'm pretty sure I said it on Religious Hard Talk too, for I can remember Ian taking me to task over it, calling me a date setter. No, I'm not an idiot. I know no man knows the day nor the hour of Christ's return, but the Bible tells us that we should know the times and the seasons, doesn't it? Matthew 24 is all about those signs. So are Revelation 13 and 17. Well, that's what I'd like to talk to you about today and over the next few episodes of this telecast. The times and the seasons and the signs surrounding the second coming of Christ. Here is how the Apostle Paul put it. That's 1 Thessalonians. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 6. Let's look at this. There are four things here that I want you to note. First, Paul says, you don't need me to write you. Here it is again. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. The times and the seasons of what? The times and the seasons of Christ's second coming. How do we know that's what he's talking about? Because the previous chapter ended with Christ's second coming, with the graves opening up and with Christ coming in the clouds. Here it is. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. That's how the previous chapter closed. So that's what he's definitely talking about. The literal, visible, climactic second coming of Christ, which your eyes and my eyes will see according to the word of God. And your ears and my ears will hear. And he says, you don't need that I should write you about this. Because uno don't know. Don't know what? Don't know the signs. 
The second thing that he does is liken the second coming of Christ to a thief in the night. A thief in the night, catching many people unawares. No, I find this incredible. That after all the signs Jesus and the prophets and Paul have left us, that his coming should be as a thief in the night to anybody with a Bible within their reach. How can this be like a thief in the night? It simply means that the vast majority of us are ignorant, whether willfully ignorant or carelessly ignorant, or just plain ignorant because we don't have Bibles. I don't know. But we're ignorant about the one thing we all should know. I'm talking about the signs pertaining to the climax of this planet's history. How is it going to end? When is it going to end? What are the clues? I said, what clues has God given us? Yes, he's given us clues. Many, many clues. Yet many of us seem totally ignorant as though the second coming of the Son of God is a myth, a fairy tale, a farce, as though God never instructed his prophets to write it down plainly for us. What does the Bible say? This is Jesus talking. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That's Matthew 24, 27. Do you understand that? Like lightning flashing across the sky, every eye shall see him when he comes in the clouds. Not on the earth, mind you, but when he comes in the clouds. That's what the Bible says. That's where the Bible says we're going to meet him. In Isaiah 24, the prophet Isaiah adds this dimension to it. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. Isaiah 24, 1 and 20. Friend, this is not a Nancy story, especially for those of us who profess to believe Christ came the first time some 2,000 years ago. We believe he came. Do we believe he's coming again the second time? This is our Christianity on the line right here. Do you believe Jesus is coming again, just as the angel said in the book of Acts? in the same manner in which he left in the clouds, literally, visibly. Here is the scripture. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. That's Acts 1, verses 10 and 11. Here it is again in the book of Revelation. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Revelation 1, 7. Every eye shall see him. This is a literal second coming, beloved. Something you and I should prepare for. For the unbelievers and mockers and the wicked will be blotted out in a moment. Slain by the brightness of his coming. Frankly, I find it incredible that especially for those of us living in a nation with so many churches, that most of us don't have a clue about the second coming of Christ. Even animals know, they say, when an earthquake is coming. So what about man, thinking man, intellectual man, smart man, and women, obviously. Graduates of UE and UTEC and NCU and medical school and law school. What about you? Look at this shot of the phone book and the number of churches being shown here. All these churches and yet such a widespread preoccupation across the land 
with the things of this life. That the very thing we should be studying, I'm talking about Christ and his return, is to a great extent crowded out. Maybe that has changed since COVID-19. But to my mind in previous years, it just seemed to me as though we Jamaicans have been busy about everything else. Everything other than the things staring us in our faces. You know, just the other day I was thinking about this, that even out at Port Royal, which I frequently visit when I'm in Jamaica, and which was said to be the wickedest city of the world at one time, they had churches and even a synagogue out in Port Royal, we're told. As you know, to see Port Royal's churches today, you'd have to dive under the water in the section cordoned off with yellow tape for most of the city was swallowed up by the sea in the earthquake of 1692. Churches and all. But there's one church out there with quite a history. This is St. Peter's Anglican Church. The original church was destroyed in the earthquake. A second church, constructed shortly after, was destroyed by the fire of 1703. This one, however, rebuilt between 1725 and 1726, still stands. In the cemetery is one very famous immigrant. I'm referring to one Louis Galdi, the Frenchman, who, while escaping Roman Catholic persecution in France, for that's what his gravestone says, fled to Jamaica and found notoriety in being spat out of the ground in the great earthquake. I can still remember my father telling me about that. Mr. Galdi lived to tell the tale and died on December 22nd, 1739, 47 years after the earthquake at age 80. And this is just one. There are old churches all around Jamaica. Going beyond the phone book, the other day I contacted the Jamaica National Heritage Trust for a list of the oldest churches in Jamaica, for I'm sure we've all heard it. Jamaica is supposed to have one of the highest per capita ratio of churches to people anywhere in the world. Now it turns out this might be just a myth, but as you can imagine, the list we got was quite long. For a while, every last one of those churches was closed because of COVID-19. But thank God for the most part, they're open again. We can not only drive up to them and admire them and photograph them, we can worship in them. Some of them are situated right near the seaside and make you just want to sit down and relax like, like you would have never leave church. Now, I obviously can't show you all the churches in our land, but Jamaica is full of them. Those on our screen were chosen either for their age, architecture, beauty, or location. Remember, Jamaica was a British colony, so the majority of the older churches are Anglican or Church of England. The two on North Street in Kingston are not. This one on the campus of St. George's College is Roman Catholic and was founded in 1850. Man, what a shot. Look at that on your screen. What a shot. And while this one almost just across the street from it is the North Street Seventh-day Adventist Church, it was founded in 1900. Now this church on Orange Street in Kingston has particular meaning to me. It's the assembly hall of the Christian brethren. I used to pass it every time I went downtown on the bus as a child, and I've never forgotten that sign. Prepare to meet thy God. A few years ago, I had the privilege of going inside that church for the first time as we interviewed a dear saint whom we saw struggling to make her way to church one Sunday morning. Deceased now, she was 80-year-old Ruby Carrington. Remember now, we're looking at churches this morning as we ponder the words of the Apostle Paul that Christ's second coming will be as a thief in the night for many. With so many churches around, even in the high crime inner city communities of Denham Town and Tivoli Gardens in West Kingston, even in the poorer communities that have grown up around what was at one time top-class areas of Kingston. I know, because my parents told me. Churches like this one, the Wesley Methodist Church on Tower Street, which has been vandalized many times, 
I find it incredible that anyone here in my homeland should be ignorant of the second coming of Christ. So the question this morning, rhetorical for sure, is this. How many of the sanctuaries across our land reared up to give glory to God and his son, having an eye towards the second coming of Christ? How many of them really do have an eye towards that second coming? I hope all of them. All right? What have we said thus far? What does Paul tell us in this passage in 1 Thessalonians 5? One, you don't need me to write you. Two, Christ's coming will be like a thief in the night. The third thing Paul does in this passage is liken the second coming of Christ to a woman in labor. Listen to him. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. That's 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. Labor pains. Ask any woman who has given birth. Those pains might be slow at the beginning, but as the time comes for that baby to be born, those pains become sharper and more intense. That's what the second coming of the Lord will be like, like labor pains. The signs of his appearing will become more rapid and more intense tense over the years. To my mind, without a doubt, COVID-19 is one of those signs for Christ, especially pointed to pestilences or disease of every stripe as one of the signs that would precede his second coming. But David, you might say, pestilences have been around from man has been on the earth. Why is this one a sign and not polio? or the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 that infected an estimated 500 million people and killed 50 million? I'll give you the answer. It has to do with where we are in the history of our planet, beloved. If the Bible is to be believed, we're on the border of our 6,000th year since Adam. You know what that means? As a friend of mine put it, we're about to push. That's a woman, of course, using that language. For those of you watching this on the internet who may not be Jamaican, that term about to push is normally associated with a woman at the point where she has to push, has to contract her muscles to push that infant out. That's what my friend was saying. This planet is about to push. But I'll get back to that. I promise. All right. The next thing Paul says is this. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 and 5. Here the Apostle Paul tells us, while the second coming of Christ may be like a thief in the night for many, not so for the believer. At least it shouldn't be so. We who know our Bibles, we who know prophecy, we who know the signs of his second coming, we are the children of light. Because of the ignorance of Bible prophecy, the world has lost so much. But we who know the word, we who know what the Bible predicts, we who know what is coming should be able to teach it and are in fact under obligation to teach it to rich and to poor, the small man and the prime minister, if he's watching, as I am doing this day, we should be able to teach it to all. Preaching it though can come with quite a price, but I won't say more than this right now. Here is Jesus in what's known as the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That's Matthew 28, 19 and 20. These are Jesus' marching orders to his followers, and that's why I'm opening my mouth today. He said, go and teach, and that's what I'm doing today. COVID-19 and the fears and uncertainty and conspiracy theories surrounding COVID-19 make it imperative that I open my mouth today. 
Why? Because I fear too many of us, while we might sense something coming, we don't have a clue as to what it really means. And that, that really doesn't sit well with me at all. That I should know what is coming. And that my church should know what is coming. And yet you not know what is coming. Come, my friend. If you have a desire to know what else is coming, then let's open our Bibles together. You know, what I said about COVID-19 being a sign, much more so than the Spanish flu, it, it, it's sort of bothering me. I don't want to get into the issue of the 6,000 years just yet, for that's going to involve taking our cameras far, far away to the Greek island of Patmos to which the oldest surviving disciple, John, had been banished. Why? I'll let him tell you. John tells you why he was banished. He says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's Revelation 1.9. John was banished to the Isle of Patmos for the word of God. Let me tell you something. And it's not in the Bible, but we're told, Tertullian tells it and others, that John was cast into a pot of boiling oil by the Emperor Domitian. And when he wouldn't boil, and they pulled him out and there was no harm on him, that's when he got banished to Patmos. Like I said, it's not in the Bible. That's tradition. Those were the days, my friend, when you paid a price for being a Christian. John paid that price. Back then, Patmos was a penal colony, a barren place, a desolate place, a place where the Roman emperors banished criminals. But look at it today. It is believed that the book of Revelation, which sheds enormous light on the concept of our earth having been allotted 6,000 years, might actually have been written from this cave but let's save that for later after we find america in the bible we can tackle the notion of all this planet has is six thousand years which i happen to believe by the way today i'd like to wrap up this section of our talk by pointing you to one verse from the lips of jesus whether it's 10 years or 10 days we have left on this planet he's the person to whom i'd like to point you today so whether you're from St. Catherine, St. Thomas, St. James, or anywhere in between, today, especially now, as we continue to adjust to this pandemic, I'd like you to consider something Jesus said. Here it is. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. That's Luke 21, 28. What is Jesus saying? When we see the signs of the end of this planet, yes, I said the end of this planet. When you see the signs begin to come to pass, we should do what? Look up. Elsewhere in the same chapter, he said we should pray that we may be accounted worthy to escape these things. Here it is. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. That's Luke 21, 26. So look up, then pray. Look up, survey the scene, use your intellect, your brain, your mind. Take it all in. Take what in? The signs that are all around us from the startling frequency of earthquakes across our globe to the oddity of tsunamis. I say oddity because tsunami is something I never even heard about as a picnic growing up. Tsunami, what is that? To rivers across the world, even here in Jamaica, turning blood red. Take it all in, beloved. With famine and pestilences and wars and rumors of wars, take it all in, just as Jesus said. Now I should tell you this morning that one of the signs of Jesus' second coming is something that I often disputed with Ian. On the air and off. Publicly, he claimed not to believe it, but I believe secretly he did. That something has to do with the emergence of a theocracy in the United States. That's a government in which the church, for the most part, calls the shots. 
You can find that prophecy in the Bible and I'll not only show you, I'll prove it to you as though we're in a court of law. I'll prove it to you line upon line, precept upon precept. I'll prove it to you so clearly you will never be the same. Your Bible will never be the same. By the time we're finished, you'll understand the beast, his image, his mark. You'll understand why the Bible is more relevant and credible than CNN, MSNBC, or Fox News. It's more valuable than a million THDs and a million winning lottery tickets. What could possibly make it so valuable? It has the future all laid out for you as a giant roadmap. That's what. Listen, let's go back to Ian. Remember what I said? Publicly, Ian claimed not to believe in the emergence of a theocracy in the United States. And on more than one occasion, on more than one telecast, he, he would come back to this point and say, David, how could America, this secular nation, ever be brought to the point where she would embrace a theocracy? He would virtually laugh at me. Some of you remember it. He would laugh at me publicly on the ear. But in that dressing room, in TVJ's dressing room, before the programs were recorded, he would open up and reasoned more like one who believed these things, or at least gave them credence. I said he reasoned more like one who, while in his heart, he might have believed in the notion of a theocracy, he found it politically expedient to adopt a public stance that scoffed at this concept. I mean, can you imagine? With the American embassy just up the road, how long do you think Ian would have survived if he had publicly come out and said, there's a theocracy coming to your country and pretty soon flights to Jamaica are going to be full of people running from it? Please note though, that even in scoffing, Ian knew he was at least engaging in the conversation that highlighted the very thing about which he was ostensibly scoffing. You get what I'm saying? That's how he saw himself as being of service. He told me that more than once. He would facilitate the conversation before the whole island. Bottom line, I don't know how much he really disagreed with the notion of an emerging theocracy. Like I said, I believe he believed it and knew it was coming, but felt it expedient not to acknowledge it publicly. And when I said, by the way, how long would he have survived? I mean, how long would the management of TVJ tolerated him saying that sort of thing? Not that I expected anybody was going to kill Ian over it. The question is, how long would they have tolerated that view? Even though it might have been biblically sound, it sounded so far-fetched, he wouldn't come out and say it. Knowing that I wanted to discuss the emergence of just such a theocracy for our last telecast, which neither of us knew would be our last, I actually ran the following promo on TVJ back in December of 2016. Come, let's look at it. Hi, David Mould here. Some of you are still in shock over the Trump victory. Let me politely address Ambassador Moreno and the US Embassy staff. The State Department won't tell you this because they don't know. But according to the Bible, there are more shocks ahead. Let your colleagues know. Let the President know. Most of us will probably live to see a theocracy emerge right there in the United States. Theocracy? Yes, with the church in control of the state. On Religious Hard Talk next Tuesday night, I'll tell you more. Theocracy? That's what I said then. Today, almost four years later, I'm saying even more. Look closely. This shot on your screen pretty much sums up what I believe the Bible teaches about what is coming to America. How could it happen in America? I'll tell you. For one, let's never forget President Trump pledged to grant more power to the church. Here he is saying it himself. I'm Protestant. I'm Presbyterian. Are you surprised to hear that? Yeah. <laughs> the, the power of of our, our group of people together. I mean, if you add it up, I was trying to do it the other day. I was with one of the, the great ministers. And I said, you know, if you think about this country, because now you're talking about men and women, you're talking about together. So the group is larger, 
Christians, Christians in this country is larger than men or women. And I said, how many Christians do you think? And it could be like 240, 250 million, you know, a big portion of, and yet we don't exert the power that we should have. Now, I think some of the churches are afraid of their tax status, to be honest. You know, they're afraid they're going to lose their tax status if they get too political. Um, some of them just can't endorse. But, you know, the fact is that there's nothing the politicians can do to you if you band together. You have too much power. But the Christians don't use their power. And, by the way, Christianity will have power without having to form. Because if I'm there, you're going to have plenty of power. You don't need anybody else. You're going to have somebody representing you very, very well. Remember that. While much of the world focused on COVID-19, in the United States, key moves continued to be made that were no doubt helping to fulfill that pledge. Like what? Like the lifetime appointment of federal judges. What's there to fear from that? Well, there's a movement that's been flying under the radar for years in America, and it's known as Dominion Theology. Its thesis, that America must be ruled by Christians, tasked with implementing God's laws across the land. How many recent judicial appointments adhere to that theology? Time will tell. Before we move on today, let's summarize one more time. All right, what have we said today? Paul says, you don't need me to write you. That's the first thing. Second, Jesus' coming will be like a thief in the night. Third, it will be like a woman in labor. Believers are not in darkness. That's number four, like the rest of the world. There is one sign over five. There is one sign over which Ian and I had our public disagreements, but I believe in his soul he believed it. That issue is the emergence of a theocracy in the United States of America. It's one of the signs to precede Christ's second coming, and it can be found in the Bible, and I promise you by God's grace, I'll show you. That's what we've said so far. All right, now let's dig in. Where is America found in the Bible? In what verse or verses? That's the question today. It's such an important question that we'll need to pray much as we study and not be careless or superficial in our analysis. Even though we're going to end up in the New Testament, we must start off in the Old, specifically in the book of Daniel. We've got to start there if we're to answer this question. Where is America in Bible prophecy? For that's where the foundation of our journey is. That's where the smoking gun is. That's where the history is. That's where the clues are in Daniel. These are clues that frankly could get us killed as we expose them to the light of day. For they resurrect a history that's been deliberately hidden from us. But we're going to sniff them out today. At least we're going to start sniffing them out. For it's going to take more than one telecast to do this. Like Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, it's going to take some time to work our way through from the city of destruction to the celestial city. In fact, our foundation over these next few telecasts, and it could, could be a dozen or more, may be much deeper than is strictly necessary, but I am making it deep. I'm taking the responsibility on my own shoulders. I'm making that foundation deep and broad and airtight because I know that after it has been presented, especially here on TVJ, it will have to stand up under the most severe, rigorous, and determined cross-examination from those who would like to say this history never occurred. This foundation must be so deep that, that the lawyers for the defense will be hard-pressed to challenge it. So be prepared. In the process of our journey, we are going to go to several countries to view for ourselves key pieces of art that will help frame our foundation. But there's one more reason we're going. We're going with our small but dedicated film crew to procure equally priceless video. Video that will hammer home in your mind the strength 
of our foundation and the accuracy of this trail that will ultimately lead us to America in the Bible. Now I'm not being funny here, but as we speak about going to look for America, there's a song running through my mind, Lord have mercy upon David Moore. You know what that song is? It's Simon and Garfunkel singing, how did they put it? They've all come to look for America. Well, that's what we're doing today. We're looking for America. All right, let's begin. Father God, please help us. No less than you helped Columbus as he set sail from Spain with the Pinta, the Nina, and the Santa Maria. May you help us today as we start our sacred journey. We're looking for America, dear Lord, but not across the Atlantic and not from Saginaw. We're looking for America in your sacred word, the Bible. May you open the eyes of everyone watching this as to the value of this gem, this journey, and to the nearness of the second coming of your son. Lead us today, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. What a piece of irony. You know something? Like Columbus, we too are going to begin our journey from Gesweer, Spain. You see this picture on your screen? It's a painting by the 17th century Spanish artist Juan de la Corte and is entitled The Burning of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar's Army. There is some scholarly debate about the date of this event, this burning, but the consensus is that it took place either in 587 or 586 BC. I felt this painting was so important for our search for America in the Bible that we actually tracked it down to this location on your screen in Spain. It's going to be one of the shots in the book that we're publishing, the revised edition of the new illustrated great controversy. But I also wanted it here in our opening session of this presentation. What led us to it? The disagreement between Ian Boyne and I that a theocracy will emerge in America. That's what has led us to it. To prove that that theocracy will come, it's important to look at the groundwork being laid for a monumental shift in American jurisprudence today. But that by itself is insufficient. To absolutely prove that this revolution is coming, we must first find America in the Bible. Once that's done, we can then lay out our case for the coming theocracy. You follow what I'm saying? We have to find America first before we can talk about a theocracy in America. So we're in search of America this morning, and we're starting with this painting right here in Spain. De La Corte's painting captures one of the most tragic chapters in Israel's history, Jerusalem. Israel's capital, and the site of their temple, once located somewhere up here on the Temple Mount, is about to be plundered, its temple destroyed, and thousands of Jews taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. In Psalm 137, we find these words, by the rivers of Babylon which many of us Jamaicans can repeat from memory because they're a part not just of the Rastafarian culture, but I dare say of the Jamaican culture and music. Here it is. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Sing us one of the songs of Zion. This psalm no doubt reflects the mood of many Jews who had been taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. You may better understand this mood if you look on a map and see how far from Jerusalem they had to walk. Better yet, let's take a flight over to Baghdad in Iraq. From there, we'll drive the 50 miles to Hillah, to the ruins of ancient Babylon. 
by the rivers of Babylon. Were the Jews ever here by this branch of the Euphrates? Most likely, for the Euphrates actually ran under Babylon's walls and figures largely in an upcoming episode. Now as for the Jewish males, I don't know how many were turned into eunuchs by the Babylonians, but among the unfortunate victims was young Daniel. We know this because the man who became his master is listed as Ashpenaz, the captain of the eunuchs. So much for the background. Sometime after the captivity, in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar is asleep in his royal city, pictured here in this British Museum, and he has a dream he can't remember. Nor can his wise men and magicians show him, but the young prophet Daniel can. God not only shows the captive Daniel Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but gives him the interpretation. Can you imagine that? You can't remember your own dream, but God raises up somebody to tell you what you were dreaming. How is that for a sign? And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. That's Daniel 2, 1 to 4. Basically, the king is saying, you are all wise men and magicians. This is what I pay you to do. Tell me, what did I dream last night? The something not bother me. Me no remember what me did dream, but me know that it's something important. Tell me, me say, what me did dream. And he threatens them. Let's go back to the Bible. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of a certainty that you would gain the time because you see the thing is gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I will know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, there is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asked any such thing of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requires. And there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause, the king was very angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. That's Daniel 2, 5 to 12. So did they die? All right, let's take a break here and come back next week to see what happened. God bless you, Jamaica. Keep focused. And as the sign on your screen says, prepare to meet thy God.